night. Trump's Jerusalem bombshell. Russia gets iced from the Winter Games. And cryptocurrency meets Hello Kitty. Congressman John Conyers said today that he's retiring. Conyers, the longest serving current House member, has been plagued by a wave of sexual misconduct allegations, which he denies. Conyers made the announcement in an interview with a local radio station in Michigan. My, my legacy can't be compromised or diminished in any way uh, by what we're going through now. This too shall pass. The 88-year-old endorsed his son to replace him. But in a family twist, Conyers' great-nephew says he plans to run for the vacant seat. Special counsel Robert Mueller's office subpoenaed Deutsche Bank for records linked to Donald Trump and his family, according to multiple reports. It suggests Mueller's investigation into Russian meddling in the 2016 election may be reaching the president's finances. Members of Trump's family, including Jared Kushner, are also clients of Deutsche Bank, which has reportedly loaned Trump at least $300 million and may have extensive records of his holdings and transactions. In a statement to Bloomberg, the bank said it, quote, always cooperates with investigating authorities in all countries. President Trump's personal attorney claims no subpoena has been issued or received. The Department of Homeland Security says the number of people caught trying to cross the border illegally dropped to its lowest level in 46 years, and that both deportations and arrests at the border declined this fiscal year compared with 2016. But far more immigrants were arrested within the United States, in part because the Obama administration largely limited immigrant arrests to people who had committed serious crimes. The Saudi-led coalition in Yemen launched multiple airstrikes overnight, targeting Houthi buildings in the capital, a day after Houthi forces killed the country's former president, Ali Abdullah Saleh. Saleh had been an ally of the Houthis until this weekend, when he announced he had switched sides. Despite the strikes, the Iran-backed Houthis claimed they were tightening their control of the capital, and crowds of their supporters took to the streets to celebrate Saleh's death. In a dramatic chain of events, the former president of Georgia broke free from Ukrainian custody after his supporters blocked the van carrying him away. Security forces had pursued Mikhail Saakashvili up to his rooftop, where masked agents initially succeeded in detaining him. Ukrainian officials say they want to question Saakashvili about alleged ties to criminal groups linked to former Ukrainian president Viktor Yanukovych. Saakashvili has accused Ukraine's current president of failing to fight corruption and today called for more protests against the leader. President Trump will make a major announcement on Israel tomorrow after reports today that he told confidants in the Middle East that he's planning to recognize Jerusalem as Israel's capital and relocate the U.S. Embassy there from Tel Aviv. The American Embassy has stayed in Tel Aviv for decades for a reason. Because with Israel and Palestine both laying claim to Jerusalem, it's the third rail of the Middle East peace process. And no U.S. president has wanted to touch it, until now. We will move the American embassy to the eternal capital of the Jewish people, Jerusalem. Moving the embassy there would fulfill one of Trump's campaign promises, but it also poses serious consequences for future negotiations. As news of Trump's plans developed, the Palestinian Authority warned of repercussions. Protests are expected as early as tomorrow, and the U.S. government told its employees to stay away from flashpoint areas, including Jerusalem's old city. Amid all the talk of the U.S. moving its embassy from Tel Aviv to this city, there's an American outpost here that some say has been serving that purpose in all but name for years. That's the consulate here. This is the U.S. consulate in the no-man's-land neighborhood in Jerusalem. What do you think it would take to turn that into an embassy? Um, oh, only a sign. And there you go. You move the embassy to Jerusalem. 
Hajit Ofran is an activist who monitors Jewish settlements in the West Bank and East Jerusalem. She thinks the controversy over the embassy is a sideshow compared to the prospect of President Trump declaring Jerusalem as Israel's capital. Moving the embassy is just a symbolic act. It doesn't really matter where physically they sit. This issue of Jerusalem is one of the most delegate issues that is in conflict between Israel and the Palestinians. You cannot just come one-sided and declare that Israel got it and the Palestinians did not get it. It's killing your possibility to be an actor. In the West Bank, Palestinians have already been preparing for that possibility. Dr. Nabil Shah is an advisor to the Palestinian president. Hello. He's been fielding constant calls from Arab media and lobbying foreign ambassadors to at least try to stop any changes from going through. In the last three days, there is no question except what are you going to do if Mr. Trump does that? Now, our president is calling every Arab leader and many international leaders for example, he just called uh, Mr. Putin, he talked to Mr. Macron. Shaath sees this as the end of the U.S. role in the peace negotiations. The U.S. is a player that you cannot just cast aside in this process. I mean, that, that's not a realistic approach, is that? I mean, what, what, what is there that you can work with? We are not going to war with the United States. We have not started a problem with the United States. The President of the United States stepped on the single most risky and important part of the peace process. To us, Jerusalem is, is a holy place. To us, Jerusalem is the single most important spot in Palestine. If you step on that, you've changed the the parameters that everybody had respected up till this moment, including all American presidents up till this moment. So instead of Trump and Kushner to the rescue, it could be Vladimir Putin or King Abdullah of Jordan or Morocco's king or almost anyone else. If it's a United Nations sponsored peace process, we will go. Even if it was sponsored by the Russians and the Chinese, we will go. But with the United States, with Mr. Trump, with his will, we will not go. To us, he is finished as a, a a, a man who can bring in the, the deal of the century, or the mother of all deals, or whatever he called it. He's out from that. Meanwhile, in the old city of Jerusalem, there's a sense of triumph among those on the Israeli right. Oren Hazan has been dubbed the Donald Trump of the Knesset. He's a lawmaker with Benjamin Netanyahu's Likud party and a hit with conservative Israelis for his outspoken views. For Hazan, Palestinian warnings that the peace process is dead shouldn't be taken seriously. That's going to be the end of the peace process. You see me is laughing. You know, they just try to scare us. They will never let the peace process die because they live from the peace process. They get money, they get donation, they get stage, they get um, uh, media, they get everything from the peace process. If the peace process is dying, the Palestinian Authority dying with him. Trump is a different president. A lot of people promised before, he will be the one that will do it, that keep his promise. By apparently making good on his campaign promise, Trump may have just put himself at a disadvantage in pulling off the deal of the century. The International Olympic Committee took an unprecedented step today. It banned Russia from the 2018 Winter Olympics in response to the country's systematic doping of athletes. Uh, as an athlete myself, I'm feeling uh, very sorry uh, for uh, all the clean athletes from all NOCs uh, who are suffering from this uh, manipulation. Countries have been banned from the Olympics before. Germany and Japan weren't allowed to participate in the 1948 Olympic Games in London because of their role in World War II. South Africa's apartheid system disqualified it from the Olympic Games from 1964 until 1992. And of course, there's a long list of juiced up athletes who've been barred from competition individually. But banning an entire country for doping is a first. And so was the level of Russia's cheating. The results of the IOC's 17-month investigation were released today. 
and confirmed the previous findings of the World Anti-Doping Agency. That probe found that Russian officials supplied more than a thousand athletes across more than 30 sports with performance-enhancing drugs between 2011 and 2015. The doping scheme reached its apex at the 2014 Winter Olympics in Sochi. Russian intelligence agents helped swap athletes' dirty urine samples with clean pee through a hole in a laboratory wall, which helped the country rack up 13 gold medals. Four of them were revoked after the caper was revealed. But Russia did walk away with the title for the biggest Olympic doping scandal of all time. Russian officials have claimed that there is no proof of systematic doping. And as part of today's ruling, individual Russian athletes will be allowed to compete if they can prove they're adhering to strict drug testing regimens. But they won't wear a Russian uniform. The country's anthem will not be played in the Olympic Stadium in Pyeongchang. And Russian officials will not even be allowed to attend the Games. For over 25 years, Oklahoma has locked up more women for drugs and drug-related crimes than any state in the country. These days, more and more of those prison stints stem from opiate addiction. Many of these women have kids, and re-entry to society not only means a risk of relapse, but a long battle to regain custody of their children. Oklahoma offers little support to repair these broken families. But one community is trying to change the perception of addicted mothers by giving them a fresh start. How did you react? Because here's the deal. That's I, important. Right. You know, maybe that's something that you need to talk to your counselor about. Yeah, I have an appointment um, Thursday, so. It's all things that we grow through. What, you don't grow in your comfort zone? That's right. <laughs> I wasn't comfortable. I've had to learn that the hard way many, many times. When a woman gets sentenced to prison, she has about two choices when she is getting ready to get out of prison. Either she can return to where she left, or she can go into a transitional program and hopefully get a new start. I do random phone checks, journal checks, hold them accountable for signing in and out of the house, making sure they're fair to each other, they treat each other like sisters. I have a little bit of a shopping problem, apparently. I know, I'm your roommate. It's called the shopping addiction. Yes, no, it, it is yes, an addiction. It is an addiction. When you come in every day with bags, more than anything, I know where these girls are. I felt it. I've been there. I ended up losing custody of my kids. Um, I, I abandoned them over what started out to be a pill addiction. My pill use was not okay. You know, I was using and abusing pills, chopping them up on the dresser, lining them up. We don't have enough transition homes in the state of Oklahoma to address the need. We house 30 women in Claremore and we constantly have a waiting list. I can only manage what I've got going on in front of me right now, which is a train, of course, because we're in Claremore and there's five million trains. I came to Claremore because I didn't have a lot of options. I was released from the Eddie Warrior Correctional Center in July. And while I was there, I applied to, I think like 14 sober living homes. And I got a response from two and they were both faith-based. The work job training component of our housing is Shebreeze Coffee House. So women come into our program that may have a challenge getting employment elsewhere because of their criminal past. And there's no way a woman can get out of jail, stay out of jail, stay out of prison and get her children back if there's no chance of employment. It's taken this entire community to help these women's lives get turned around. 
We have the lemon bar, butter bar, and the cappuccino brownie. Butter bar. Good choice. <laughs> the lemon's my favorite, but the butter bar is good too. We're storm chasers. <laughs> storm sitters. <laughs> My goal with my son is just to be an active part of his life. My active addiction pretty much stole his childhood away from me. And I find it so disheartening that only the super determined find a way out of the black hole that addiction is. It's very much, we're just a family. I look back. Wait, you have to make a silly face. Come back. Okay. <laughs> I know that I probably overdosed at least three times. I don't know how people do it that don't come to sober living. Today, I struggle with um, not having my kids. Um, I was supposed to get my kids tomorrow, and I'm not going to for some lame reason, um, which I'm okay with that, whatever. I'm not in control of that. I know that when the time's right, I'll get my kids back, so... That's it, that's all. Thanks for letting me share. Glad you're here, thanks for sharing. I didn't get to see my son last week and I don't know if my ex-husband's gonna let me see him this week just because of everything that's going on. It would just really do me some good. It would just do my soul some good. I believe that most addict moms in Oklahoma regret that they have chosen drugs over their children. But in reality, drug addiction will make you choose drugs over your children. We thank you for doors that are open and doors that are closed, Lord. Like a mom, I love them, right, wrong, or indifferent. And if they're honest about things and, and if they just can be responsible and submit to the ways of this new life, that I'll walk it out with them as long as we're together in this house. We just ask all of these things in your precious name. Amen. 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 Why are you still holding my hand, you weirdo? <laughs> Come on. Come on. Don't let go. I won't let go. You might think cryptocurrency is just for drug dealers and rich tech guys paranoid that a pitchfork-wielding mob is going to take all their normal money. But it's also for people who like breeding imaginary cats. People just like you and me. CryptoKitties is a game played on the Ethereum blockchain with Ether, the second biggest cryptocurrency after Bitcoin. You can buy and sell cats, or breed them to make a new cat, or rent them out to breed. It makes kitty DNA a kind of metaphor for blockchain. Each cat has a unique digital identity, and from that it gets its unique features, like green eyes or spots. Kitties with rare traits are more likely to have rare traits in their offspring, though cheap, common kitties can, in theory, be bred to produce a rare and expensive cat. We spoke to Dieter Shirley, co-founder of CryptoKitties at game developer Axiom Zen. The transformation of the 90s and the early 2000s was that suddenly things that used to be scarce, like music and written content, were suddenly infinitely copyable. Blockchain makes digital scarcity possible. Bitcoin came along and said, well, what if we made it so that some things are digital, they're not instantly copyable? And in the case of Ethereum, it, the idea was, well, what, what other things can we do? People have spent about $5 million on CryptoKitties since the game launched November 28th. It's so popular, it slowed down Ethereum, at one point yesterday accounting for 14% of all transactions on the network. According to CryptoKitty Sales, a site that tracks money spent through the game through publicly available information, the most expensive cat sold for more than $117,000. Overall, more than 32,000 cats have been sold. I started seeing people flipping them within a few hours for 100% profit. That number just astounds me, to be honest. If, but in a weird way, I'm not surprised either. Digital scarcity is extremely new. The fact that the CryptoKitties team made them look so cute and each one is unique, this craze is just taps into that need to collect something interesting and own it, actually own it. De La Riviere says there are broader implications than a neat cat gimmick. If this goes beyond just CryptoKitties to any big company like Disney or anything else, it could be much, much more surprising and weird.
Yeah. That's funky. That's fantastic. I love jazz to, to a major degree. The whimsicalness of how light a melody could be over some really intense progression and changes. It's a lot of content to process, which I love. As you can tell she can really sing because she's doing you know, a bit of vocal runs. It's nice that people still make music like that, you know? Uh, what would I be doing to this song? I could be eating straight soy sauce, making out with my cat, Messing with the lights. It's like, I got a bullhorn. It made a call for me blasting the bullhorn. Like, this is fantastic. Ooh, need some gunshots. Feels like I'm about to meet Thor. That was a pretty intense intro. It's a nice, good, solid walk into the club and order a triple shot. That reminds me of the cool scene in a movie where it's that one guy is finally going to get to have sex with that girl. It's like super bad. It makes me want to chop stuff with a sword or stare my cat in the eyes forcefully. Girl, you could tear me apart, but I can't help it. I'm waiting here with open arms. Oh. <laughs> it's like safe trap. The harmonies, uh, it was cool. Dream pop music. The first thing that always comes to mind ever is like, would Frank Zappa do it? <laughs> Would he do it? No. Are we to speak? First day of the week. Stumbling words at the bar. Sounds like he found a dick in his girl's phone. <laughs> it's like he calls his friend like, hey man, I, I gotta talk to you. I found a dick in my girl's phone. And then that song starts. Who is it? Sufjan Stevens. Oh wow, okay. I like it because it's, you know, the simple playing and singing. I do like that but I still feel like you got cheated on. <laughs> That's Vice News Tonight for Tuesday, December 5th.